I've been looking forward to this tutorial. It's one of my favorites to actually teach. And I'm basically at the start here, guys, I'm gonna to talk to you about exercise being associated with certain experiences. So let's just imagine images representing this, I suppose we've got some bunch of uh, active people and we're gonna get into sort of uh, broad uh, target groups in a second. But I just wanna sort of say some of the impacts. Well, first of all, especially in the psychological sense, um, we may be experiencing positive mood. And just to sort of differentiate, moods are longer term than things like emotions. Emotions can be quite temporary, as you probably know. You feel good one moment, you feel bad, you feel angry, it dissipates. Moods are, are not permanent, but they're a little bit long, more longer lasting. They tend to be more over, more over hours, sometimes days. So that's what we mean by a mood. And, and um, physical activity can really improve our mood. Secondly, and of course, it's not difficult to sort of link these two points together. We do think that people experience enhanced self-esteem. Now, this is an interesting point. Self-esteem is a fairly, well, a very significant factor when it comes to the way that people view themselves, feel about themselves, value themselves. And of course, if physical activity can boost that, then that is good for everyone. Also, on a practical level, people who are active also experience what we'd call enhanced sleep quality now i'm going to come to this in other tutorials funnily enough but especially the relationship of two kinds one of rem and non-rem sleep that's deep sleep and non-deep sleep but also the ratio of in bed time to sleep time is better and i'll come back to that in more details but basically people spend about the right amount of time in bed asleep if you see what i mean now you probably sort of imagine where that's going to go when we look at that in a bit more detail um we also find that with females that physical activity is is correlated with a positive impact on menstruation. So that's not obviously the same for all people, and no one's necessarily claiming a causal relationship here, but menstruation is facilitated, or healthy menstruation is facilitated help by activity, as is pregnancy, more of which in a few moments' time, as is menopause, lots more of which in a few moments time. So these sort of stages and cycles in a female's life, obviously menstruation being the most regular, pregnancy being less frequent, sometimes never, and menopause being once in life, I believe. Um, these are significant impacts on, on a female's overall health. And then finally, I really wanna get this point across to you. There is a consistent consensus. There is a consistent worldwide link consistent worldwide link between the following things increased physical activity doing being more physical and decreased rates of depression now don't get me wrong i am absolutely not qualified to say what that link is or that physical activity defeats depression or whatever or vice versa i have not i am not qualified to say but what i think is fair to say is that many studies have correlated that people with higher levels of physical activity on average are less likely to experience depression. And that's the only claim we're making here as a generalization. Okay, so the next thing I wanna do is just to say how. How does it go about doing this? How does physical activity actually achieve that? So these are some of the theories behind this. First of all, there's one theory that suggests that core body temperature, so core temperature goes up. And this is called the thermo, the thermogenic hypothesis okay and the idea of this i mean you can link it back to your physics and your kinetic theories is obviously molecules bounce about with more warmth with higher temperature and that might lead to more efficient processes and a more general sense of well-being in a person also it's also believed that cerebral to the core, the cerebral cortex of the brain, so cerebral, cerebral, oh my God, cerebral blood. Why is that so hard to say? Blood flow goes up, so more blood to the to the conscious brain, but you know, to the to the conscious brain ultimately. Another one is the is the idea of endorphins. Now, I'm confident you would have come across this before. So what we're talking here is we're talking about endorphin production, and that endorphin production post exercise especially but also during exercise sometimes in, in anticipation of exercise is an increase and we could call that a, sort of a feel-good factor but i want to take it a little bit further i don't want to talk about endorphins here i want to talk about neurotransmitters so we're going to talk about an increase in serotonin now serotonin is a neurotransmitter in the brain that's associated with positive feelings so let me put that in there so it's a neurotransmitter associated with positive feelings i'll put it like this positive 
feelings, happiness, optimism, joy, satisfaction. These things are associated with the serotonin. And this leads to what we call the serotonin hypothesis. And this is basically that people who exercise regularly are probably more of a positive mindset because of the increased production and presence of serotonin in the way described. Let's take things further. I've got a couple more points before we get into some nitty gritty here. I also want to talk about the increased production of what's called norepinephrine. Norepinephrine. You can also call this noradrenaline, by the way. And what it does is it causes a heightened alertness. Heightened alertness. So it's, it's almost sort of saying, you know, exercise is like a stimulant. It also causes vigor. Now, there's some really fascinating studies about the importance of vigor in the psychological sense. Um, we'll perhaps touch on those on, on the sports psychology course. But vigor is associated with obviously trying hard, more contentment, more satisfaction, more productivity, and so on. Now, final point in this, and I think lo- all of us can relate to this. When we exercise, we have an enhanced body image. If we were to ask you know, the average person why they exercise, for example, or how they feel if they don't exercise, they're probably going to talk about how they look, how they feel, how other people see them. And of course, this is something that really sort of builds us as individuals if we feel sort of aesthetically or physically just a little bit healthier. Now, with all that in mind, what I want to do here is I want to talk about a couple of factors. About to, I'm going to talk about age, as a group obviously different people at different ages we're going to talk about people experiencing pregnancy Uh, my pen slowed down for some reason and i'm going to talk about the uh, period of menopause obviously the latter two referring to female specifically so when we talk about age what are we what are the what are the recommendations well just reminder first of all depending if you study this already adults should be doing the following thing they should be doing five times 30 mins per week per week that's the recommended minimum level we also know that there should be two times vigorous sessions so two of those five should be vigorous let's say weight training for example or running and that they should uh, and the adults should be doing their best and this is hard in adult life to decrease the amount of time sitting down and now I'm talking there about the UK recommendations. Now with children, it's kind of similar, but when we're talking about children, what we're saying here is that it's the recommendation is seven times 60 mins. I meant to change color there. Seven times 60 mins for children. And there should be three times vigorous sessions. And that's what we that's what we're referring to, sort of a recommended uh, activity. Now, this is interesting because the point I really want to get to is if we assume that that is the case, what we want to look at is we want to look at people who are, let's say, over, that's a greater than sign, older than 65 years old. What is the recommendation? Well, the recommendation is the same. Hence, a saying activity needs to be lifetime based. But what we're talking about here is that with older people, the relative intensity will decrease so obviously we're probably not going to be sprinting at the age of 75 or or, you know we might be running we certainly be walking one would hope but the relative intensity is going to drop now i say relative because of course you know if you walk fast at 80 years old depending on who you are probably is going to feel quite intense but that's that relative point now let's take things further folks we're going to have a little look at pregnancy here i find this really fascinating by the way because some of the myths that surround this are, are quite remarkable this is the core takeaway guys exercise is excellent and i really want to put that in capital letters uh, for pregnant women so whatever myths you've heard that you know you you get to the you know someone will get to 12 weeks pregnant and shouldn't move it no absolutely and I, i'm not going to get into the details of this because i don't know if it's still the recommendations of where i live in the uk the nhs but actually including in birth moving maybe not sport and things like that but during birthing them moving around being active allowing gravity and physicality to have its impact it's actually really really positive but we're talking about throughout pregnancy exercise can be really positive for a, a pregnant woman now a couple of things the other thing we think is the case or the ref- the evidence suggests is it can help not do it on its own it can help prevent pregnancy related diseases okay so someone who is pregnant and might experience pregnancy related diseases is less likely to do so because they're active now just let me give you a couple of examples of what they might be things like anxiety 
which of course can potentially be an illness if it's ex experienced over a longer period of time. What about things like weight gain? Okay, we might not necessarily think about that as an illness, but certainly if it, it, if it um, goes into depression, uh, depression, obesity, sorry, and depression. These conditions are less likely if a person is physically active. So that's the case. Now, the other point I want to make about pregnancy is the following, is what we would call postpartum. So this is after the baby's been born or the babies, I suppose, uh, twins, triplets and that. So what we recommend is a gradual, it's, a, it's actually a bit like concussion. <laughs> Never said that before. Pregnancy is a bit like concussion. I'm not sure a woman would agree with me, but it's a graduated return to recommended adult levels. Now, obviously, when one has a, a little baby, it's kind of hard necessarily to go out for a jog, but the ideal circumstance is that a person will gradually return to recommended adult levels, five times 30 minutes minimum, too vigorous, not too much sitting down. Again, there's all the feeding, all that stuff going on, so obviously that's not necessarily straightforward. Now, I just want to define menopause for you. Menopause is the period when a person's, when a, a female's menstruation cycle will end. And menopause has occurred 12 months after the time. I believe it's the start of the last period or is it the end? Don't quote me on that, I can't remember. So a couple of things I wanna mention here, first of all. Firstly, menopause can have some negative impacts, okay? So it's linked to a condition called sarcopenia. So menopause is linked to a condition of sarcopenia. And what this means is a loss of muscle tissue. Okay, so that's not ideal. And it might be something that women of menopausal age might wanna be aware of. Secondly, it's also related to osteopenia. osteopenia. <laughs> Why is that hard to say? Osteopenia. Okay, and what we mean by this is that this is effectively like the degradation of bone tissue. And that can lead in extreme cases to osteoporosis, sort of more brittle bones, okay? Now, just these points here, this one and this one, these both have been clinically linked to increased incidence of women falling and hurting themselves post-menopause because their body is changing that way. Not because they're not strong enough to stand up, but because their dimensions, their strength, their power out, but to their weight has changed over that period of time. Um, and I also wanna introduce you on this last point, the one we made here, I wanna introduce you to this one. There is often what's called a decreased BMD. BMD, this is bone mineral density. This idea that the bone matrix actually uh, actually gets lower and it's ultimately this that leads to those falls I mentioned before. And then finally, guys, I just wanna make a really important point that I think is absolutely useful for anyone who may experience menopause. Um, this condition, what is absolutely consistently reported is that active menopausal women, menopausal women, they consistently report um, what you would call higher quality of life score, QOL scores. Quality of life scores go up for, for women who experience menopause and manage to be active meanwhile and afterwards. So I think that's a really, really nice message to end on. Obviously, the broad message here is be active. It's good for you. Find the age group, a moment associated kind of guidance and do your best to achieve that and things should be good.